Hello and good morning, everybody. This is Jake, and you are here for another Land Effects webinar. Uh, we got a special guest for you today. This is uh, Sports Field Design Part Two. So we've already done Part One. This is the second part, continuing on with Don Franklin, our best friend. Um, I'll let him introduce you a little bit more, but. Um, few housekeeping items. We're going to go ahead and let you know that this is being recorded. And uh, Don, I guess, yeah, go ahead and present. This is being recorded, so you will be able to watch this later. There's a lot of information going on in this um, presentation. So hold on to your shorts. Um, we do have that Q&A button that you can go ahead and click right now, open up that Q&A dialog box so that you can ask your questions. Have that chat window there, just if you guys want a little bit of friendly banter back and forth. But uh, like I said, we got a lot to go over, so I'm gonna pass this right on to Don. Well, this is a little bit about me. Um, won't spend much time on this. I have been in the industry for over 51 years and, um, my job is my hobby. I just uh, got into landscaping and irrigation design and the technical side of it um, and have enjoyed it ever since. Uh, for the last 51 years, I've never, I've never gone to work. My job is my hobby. So in review, um, from part one, we talked about head selection and using the right product for the application, head spacing, getting the best distribution uniformity and the effects of wind and head spacing, and then placing heads in high traffic areas in sports fields so that the sports turf managers can um, do the repairs that they need to do in these high traffic areas without overwatering um, the rest of the field. But today, we're gonna to be talking about um, velocity Today's gasket, and we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we're going to spend quite a bit of time on pressure surges and the effects of those surges, and how to manage uh, those surges and water hammer. You have a lot of resources that are out there, not only with Land FX, um, great program as far as you know, pipe sizing and everything to help mitigate these pressure surges. But you have uh, great resources from the Irrigation Association. And uh, those are just, um, if you can key into those at irrigation.org um, and, and get some of those technical uh, design manuals, that would be great. And then there's a lot of uh, online free stuff um, over at Hunter Industries. Uh, you can download the um, Handbook of Technical Irrigation Information for free. And it has a ton of useful information and even a water hammer calculation in there, main loop, uh, mainline loop systems and you know how to calculate all of that stuff. Uh, and then over at Rainbird, they have a lot of good resources and Toro and, and other just irrigation manufacturers that are out there have really good resources that they will give to you for free. So you can kind of build up your library. So we're gonna get right into some really basic things. Um, I'm not sure the level of knowledge of everybody who is on this webinar. So we're just gonna just review real quickly the friction loss charts. Uh, on, the, on the left side of the chart, you have flows or GPM. Um, and this, these friction loss charts are really what um, is my go-to place when I'm trying to figure out pipe sizing and trying to calculate uh, water hammer and, and pressure surges. I'm going to these charts all the time. And it's for different types of pipe. On this one, it's class 315. And at the top, you have the pipe sizes. And below, 
each pipe size, you have the velocity and PSI loss. Uh, and we'll be keying in a lot on velocities during this webinar. Um, and also remember too, that um, these measurements are all based on 100 feet of pipe. So you wanna make sure that when you're doing your calculations, you take that 100 foot section into consideration. And basic hydraulics, um, any of you that have been through any IA classes or other uh, ir irrigation design classes, the water needs to travel no faster than five feet per second. We'll talk about that. You wanna stay out of the shaded areas. When you get into larger systems and you're using larger diameter pipe, the larger the, the pipe diameter, the more volume of water and the more weight it carries. So when you're getting into these three inch, four inch, six inch, even 12 inch sizes, you need to be aware that you have a lot of force in, the, in these piped systems with the amount of water that is going through, um, going through your irrigation system. And so the question really comes up is, well, then how fast should water move in a large irrigation system? So my analogy that I kind of, kind of bend your thinking a little bit here is that, um, We've got two vehicles. Jake is driving in the semi and I'm driving in the Volkswagen bus. And our speed limit is 25 miles an hour. We're heading for a block wall. Question, which vehicle is going to do the most damage to the block wall? We're both going at the same speed, but Jake has more volume, more weight behind him. And so you're absolutely correct. The semi is gonna do the most damage. And why is that? Well, it's mainly because a cubic foot of water is equal to a little under seven and a half gallons. And the weight of that one cubic foot of water is a little more than 62 pounds. So if we had a four inch main line, class 200, it actually will hold about a little over one cubic foot and a little over eight gallons per lineal foot. So if I take my cubic foot and I multiply that times the amount of weight that is in one cubic foot, I have 1.07 multiplied by 62. In a linear foot, I'm going to have almost 67 pounds of weight in that linear foot. Okay, so what do I do with that information? Well, let's say that your main line is a thousand feet in four inch class 200. You have approximately 66,791 pounds of water that you're moving through that main line. That 66,000 pounds is more than an empty semi 18 wheeler truck. So you have the potential of creating huge damaging surges unless your design, um, unless you design properly to take that into account. Simply put, there's just more weight, more mass. So how do we relate that to say a soccer field? If water is moving at five feet per second, 400 feet of main line, how much thrust is there gonna be at this elbow that's down in the lower right-hand corner? Well, when you look at that, there are charts that are out there by various engineering firms and we'll delve into this in more detail further down in our webinar. But in a four inch main line, at 100 PSI, you could actually have as much as 2,600 2, pounds of thrust. And so you need to, as you're designing and you're putting in these systems, you need to be able to manage 
these surges. So as we talk about surges at water hammer, it can actually be calculated in our uh, soccer field example, we have 400 feet of mainline. Our operating pressure is gonna be 80 PSI. Our velocity is five feet per second. So we're out of the shaded areas. We're feeling pretty good about that. And the closing speed on our valve is a half a second. That actually can create 360 PSI surge with the, as that valve is closing. And this is gonna happen all the time, which is why we recommend that you never go over five feet per second in an irrigation system, because water is changing speed, direction, stopping, starting. And there are several factors that create this pressure surge and or water hammer. And they're basically the operating pressure, the velocity, the length of the pipe, and the time it takes for the valve to close in seconds. And so this is a calculation that are in several of those references that, um, that we looked at earlier on. If you're not a math person uh, and you want the, the easy way, which I will do from time to time is log on to this website and they have an online water hammer calculator if you wanna see what the surges are gonna be. So going back to our uh, soccer field, and we had 400 feet at 80 PSI, five feet per second, you can see the math up here, and this is how we came up with 360 PSI surge. Now you have control over some of these factors. The main line, you need 400 feet of main line to get out to where, wherever you're going with this. And you have to have the 80 PSI. So those are two things that you probably don't have much wiggle room on. But you do have wiggle room in the velocity and the closing speed of the valve. And so if we were just to take our velocity and reduce it to about three feet per second on this, and we run through the calculation, you can see that our PSI surge is 248 PSI. Just by reducing the velocity by two feet per second and taking it down to three, we've knocked off over 100 PSI. That's looking pretty good. But you also have control over the valves that you use. And there are several manufacturers that um, tout that they have slow closing valves. And when we talk about the valve closing speed, we're not talking about when you remove the 24 volts from the solenoid and the time it takes the water to shut off. The closing speed is actually just a few centimeters or a few um, tenths of an inch or so that that, that that seat is actually going to seat down on the valve itself and stop it. So it's a, it's a very small space and, um, and it can be a half a second is common in most valves, but there are manufacturers that have uh, slow closing valves that are out there. And if we just take that and choose a valve where its closing speed is two, uh, two seconds, look at how much we've reduced the PSI surge. And so we've, we've, these are things that we can, can control. We've reduced the velocity by, by two feet down to three feet per second. We've chosen a valve that has a slow closing speed and we've knocked off more than 200 PSI. 122 PSI surge is very, very manageable when it comes to uh, surges in your irrigation system. Pauses. Well, there are several things that will cause surges in water hammer. High velocities, large volumes of water. We've already kind of discussed that. You can see the damages that's, that, um, that these surges can, 
can produce change in direction, long pipe runs, and sometimes, you know, changing direction along pipe runs, those are just, that's part of an irrigation system. Air getting trapped in the line. Um, that is a huge problem because water does not compress, but air does compress. And we'll, we'll run through a calculation to just see how much uh, surge can actually occur when you have trapped air inside your, your main line. And then your valve switching on and off. These are all causes of pressure surges and water hammer. And if you're interested to know um, additional uh, information on burst ratings for pipe uh, and pressure ratings and whatnot, then you can log on to different pipe manufacturers. They have that information that you can download. So in, in managing pressure surges and water hammer, we want to slow the velocities. You have control over that. You slow the velocities by reducing the demand and or increasing the pipe sizes. And so you can also mitigate your surges by installing pressure regulating valves on your pump stations or in the system, installing air release valve or air relief, pressure relief valves by installing those on your system and installing continuous air release valves at high points on your main line and at the end of main line because you're always going to have air in the system. That's part of the makeup of water. And as it's turning and, and moving through and starting and stopping, air bubbles um, accumulate in there. And so you can get air pockets. And by installing a continuous air release valve in proper areas on your system, it will allow the air to escape but not let the water to, uh, escape. So these are just you know, a few um, products that you can use to help manage your pressure surges and water hammer. The benefits of slowing the water down, well, it helps to eliminate pressure surges and water hammer. It can reduce repairs in labor, material, and whatnot. If you have blown out um, from water hammer a professional sports field, I mean, the cost to do the repair on that is huge. And so you, by reducing and slowing the water down, you can help to mitigate that. And, um, The other benefits of slowing velocities down is over time, velocities may change. And you may be asking, well, how can that happen? And it's by uh, maintenance contractors installing incorrect nozzles on your system. So let's take a look at a system that is being designed. We're going to use class 315 pipe. We've got on this system, we have uh, five rotors with a number 20 nozzle at 20 gallons each. So a maximum of 100 gallons per minute. And our velocities are under five feet per second. So we're feeling pretty good about this. We've decided using a three inch main line. But as the system goes on, the maintenance contractor comes in and he starts noticing some dry areas. And so, with several maintenance contractors because they don't understand the dynamics in an irrigation system, the hydraulics, they'll go through and install a bigger nozzle. So instead of a number 20, they'll install a number 30 nozzle at 30 gallons a minute. And when you do the calculation, now you're at over seven feet per second. And that's a perfect environment for water handling. So how can you help to uh, maintain 
um, lower velocities through the life of the system. It's pretty simple. These are dry spots and they are caused by, and you've, seen, you've all have seen them. And when you see these dry spots, uh, maintenance contractors, they again will have a tendency to put in bigger nozzles because they think that more water will help get rid of the dry spots when in fact it has the opposite effect. And so these dry spots are caused by poor spacing, which we talked about in our first session, and low pressure because as the maintenance person puts in bigger nozzles, he increases the demand which increases the velocity and decreases the amount of pressure. So when you're in the design phases of this, again, going back to our uh, class 315, instead of using three inch, we've decided to use four inch. Everything else is the same. We're at hundred gallons uh, per minute and our velocities are actually below three feet per second. So that's very cool. The maintenance contractor sees some dry spots. He comes in, he installs number 30 nozzles and he's up to 150 gallons. We're still below that five foot per second. And so by just simply upsizing the pipe, you can ensure that they will have a long-term successful system, even though they may be going in and changing nozzles and, and moving things around and increasing velocities. In several of the technical handbooks that I referenced earlier, this is how you would calculate velocities. And there are, are online calculators to do this as well. But I typically will go to the um, friction loss chart. Um, if I'm not feeling like I want to do the math, and so I will really try to stay um, on my mainline sizes, my large main lines. I try to stay right around that three foot per second rule instead of taking it all the way down to the five foot per second rule, just simply because I want the system to be successful long term. Jake, do we have any questions? At this time, not right now. So I want to remind everybody that as we're going through this kind of stuff, keep in mind, um, we want to answer those questions as they maybe apply to the sections and stuff like that. Any other questions you do have pertaining to this kind of stuff, definitely start writing those up as well. But you're doing a great job. All righty. Well, let's talk about fittings and thrust blocks. So I'm asked all the time, which is the best to use? Should I use solvent weld or should I use gasketed or what I call mechanical fittings? And, uh, you know, it, this as a designer, this is something that you have to kind of take into account. Um, and there are plus and minuses on both sides uh, of, this, of this question. So gasketed or mechanical fittings, you know, they're going to be more expensive. It's going to be more labor to install. Uh, thrust blocks are required uh, when you're using uh, mechanical fittings, which you can see on the right hand side of the screen. Solvent weld fittings, um, you know, they're faster to install, a lot less labor and, and typically don't always require thrust blocks. In some situations they do, particularly in soils where you have a lot of movement based on soil temperature and whatnot. And mechanical fittings can be, you know, as much as three times the cost of solvent well fittings. Now in the lower part of the screen where you see this beautiful installation of pipe, this was done over at UC Davis in California. And it was not done by a, con a contractor. It was actually done by their maintenance people. And, you, and I mean, that's a great trench if you had to go in after this is uh, covered up and repair any of those lines that they're kind of nice. They're, they're separated and whatnot. But the maintenance guys 
have gone in and done repairs on mainline that have uh, blown apart for various reasons. So they understand and know how to do solvent weld on larger pipes. And that's what they opted to do on this one. And it was purely a cost consideration and knowing that they had the skills to actually do solvent welding. With other contractors, they're typically wanting to come in, get it installed as quickly as possible and move on to the next project. And so um, I typically like to see um, anything two and a half inch or larger, and this is just my personal preference, two and a half inch or larger um, be mechanical type fittings. Uh, it just, it reduces, it, I know there's gonna be more cost up front, but it's gonna reduce the maintenance costs if something breaks um, down, down the road. If, if the mechanical, if the solvent weld fitting fails because the contractor didn't put enough primer on it, didn't really put the proper amount of glue on it, didn't hold it uh, in the fitting long enough so it, it, it doesn't push out, um, I mean, lots of different reasons as to why those fittings can fail. And if a fitting fails on a sports field or on a golf course to go back in and do the repairs on that are gonna cost a whole lot more than doing mechanical fittings at the very beginning. So let's look at some thrust block information. This was the, uh, the chart that we had up earlier. And um, this is from uh, E.J. Prescott, and their website is up there uh, at the top of the screen. Um, and they're a, uh, an engineering firm. There are lots of engineering firms that have this type of information. But they're assuming um, that, the, that the block is, is going to, that the thrust is going to be horizontal on a four-inch fitting. And typically, um, the main line is going to be tested at 200 PSI, and it's going to be in sandy soil. And so as we look at this chart at 100 PSI, they can see as much as uh, 2,600 pounds of thrust from a pressure surge. Well, if the pipe is being tested at 200 PSI, and it's just simply a multiplication problem in that you have two times 2,600, and you can have a potential of over 5,000 pounds of thrust on that four inch 90. Okay. So, what do we do with that information? Well, the soil in this example is sand and you'll find it uh, here on this table. And the bearing load for sand is 2,000 pounds per square foot. So how do we then calculate the size of our thrust block? Well, it's now a division problem. You take 5,200 divided by 2,000, and you're gonna have an area that's just slightly under a three by three um, foot area. In, in regard to how big your thrust block needs to be. Thrust blocks should be installed against undisturbed soil. It, they never should be uh, just poured in, um, concrete poured into, into the trench behind a 90 or at a T or something along those lines. They need to be um, up against undisturbed soil and never put concrete over the fitting. That's not acceptable. And I have seen stones and bricks and concrete blocks and even wood um, used as thrust blocks in uh, various installations and they're not proper material. And these thrust block uh, details are available on the website. And when you look at the actual installation of these thrust blocks, you can see some of them can be pretty good size. 
And the gentleman down in the lower left-hand corner has put up some, uh, uh, some, some fittings so the concrete stays where he's poured it, he's measured it. He wants to make sure that, that he's got the right size thrust block. Um, in some of these other pictures, you can see they use sandbags, but in, they're all installed in uh, against non-disturbed soil. And so in the right-hand side of this screen, you can see <laughs> where you should or how you do not install a thrust block. Can you imagine if you had to go in, if that blew apart in the upper right-hand corner and you had to go in and fix that? What a pain in the rear end. Even though it's against undisturbed soil, they've poured it over the fitting. Done. Yep. I, uh, a funny story about that is I've had to deal with uh, back, not, not at the backflow, but down at the stop and waste, six feet down, somebody has cemented in around the middle of the pipe, not even the 90. So the, <laughs> the pipe went <laughs> through and down. So it wasn't even at the actual fitting. It was just around the top portion of it. And that was six feet down that I had to kind of deal with that. So it's, it's funny the people's logic sometimes on what they think might help hold it. Well, they think, yeah, they think that a blob of concrete, you know, is gonna help, you know, stop it. Yep. And what's interesting is on, the, on this lower right-hand corner, yeah, the concrete is up against undisturbed soil on one side, but on the other side, actually where the thrust is gonna be, it's wide open. Yep. So it's, um, you know, concrete is not, concrete, th uh, how would I say this? Concrete is not the magic bullet when it's done incorrectly. When it's done correctly, um, it can really help to manage against these uh, water hammer and, and thrust surges. So we're moving through this pretty quickly, uh, Jake. And, and um, I think we've covered just about everything. We've gone through a lot of technical stuff. Do we have any questions or anything about any of the calculations? Yeah, I mean, I we got one coming in just from a fundam fundamentally um, how water hammer happens. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we tried to explain that from like the vehicle diagram and the mass and stuff like that. But maybe if we can just reiterate how that water hammer is happening and uh, what part of the valve that is occurring on and where it starts and where it is then kind of trickling down and affecting. Maybe we talk about that a teeny bit more. Um, so in, in water hammer, it, what was interesting, um, I'm going to kind of go around the barn because we have, or around the mountain, if you will, because we do have time for this, that um, there was a large regional park that was installed up in, uh, up in the county that I live in. And it was maintained for a year by the contractor, who was a good contractor. And, um, and they never had a blowout at all. And it was a six inch main line that was running throughout this entire regional park. And then they turned it over to um, the maintenance people um, for the county. And it had a, a booster pump on it, uh, a variable frequency drive booster pump. So that, that, was, that was a good choice. And as soon as the maintenance people um, took it over from the county, they started having blowouts all over the place, almost one a week. And so the maintenance contractor had to come in and repair these blowouts. Well, when the, main, when the contractor came in to repair these, he's now introducing air into the system because they've had to come in, dig it out, cut the pipe. They now have a lot of air in the system. And when, um, when they went to recharge, the system, they did not do it properly. And the proper way, once you break into the mainline system and you have to now recharge it with water, the recommended speed is about one foot per second. So the water moves in slowly 
and allows the air to move uh, to move out of the system by uh, either opening uh, a valve or having a continuous air release valve. So this went on for about a year. Um, that um, the, the maintenance guys would have blowouts once a week, at least once a month. Um, and so they, we called Spears in, they came in, they did some pressure checks and all this other type of stuff. And um, we never heard back from them. They were thinking that their uh, the uh, landscape architect and the, the, the county were thinking that maybe they had some defective um, fittings. And Spears checked that, but we never heard back from them. Um, and it just, it didn't solve the problem. Still water hammer was being created and it was being created because air was being introduced into the system. That was part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that we found that we had such a great um, booster pump on there and that the incoming pressure was actually higher than what it was uh, expected to be, about twice as high, that the booster pump was actually then creating higher pressure situations. And the maintenance guys were thinking, hey, we need to get this watering done in, you know, in six hours so people can use the park because it had lights for the ball fields and stuff. So they were using it at night. And so we're going to, hey, we can turn on four, we can turn on five or six valves at one time and get this whole thing done. What they didn't realize is that, yes, the pump could supply not only the pressure, but the volume of water. But the main line, they were exceeding the, the velocity in the main line was something like 13 feet per second when we actually started measuring the GPM going through the system. So what should have been running at no more than five feet per second, because the maintenance thought they had the pressure, that they were running 13 feet per second. So you combine that 13 feet per second with the air that's already in the main line because it wasn't properly vented and they were um, just turning everything on that they could, created a perfect situation for water hammer. And that's, that's how it happens, is that air gets in the system, water comes to a sudden stop because valves are turning on and off, in, in your system, water comes to a sudden stop. Air, and because water cannot be compressed, air is compressed. So the, the, it actually creates this shock wave that goes back and forth. And in studies that they've done at the University of Colorado, they have found that the water the pressure caused from water hammer can be sometimes 15 times higher than the operating pressure. And it depends on how much air. And so once the air is compressed, it then pushes the water back to this closed section or the 90 or a T and, and the fittings just can't take that kind of surge. And so they split. And so um, what causes it? Typically air and velocity. Slowing the velocity down really helps to manage the water hammer situation and keeping air out of the system um, helps to manage that. Does that make sense? It does. And just to reiterate too, that water hammer very seldom, I would, in my experience at least, happens on the downstream of the valve. This is always from a mainline perspective because the water Correct. is pressurized. It is the mass of water that is continually moving through the system. It might shake on certain valves and not other valves. You might get water hammer, you know, in, in some valves versus other valves, either lighter or not at all or heavier, but it's definitely a, a mainline 
caused deal or, or centrally focused on the main line um, at the specific valve. Now I've, I've been on, I've seen uh, water hammer shake in the middle of a, a valve where the valve is, you know, really far away and I can still hear it in the pipes, you know, mm-hmm. so that whole concept of changing direction in the pipes and how that is all set up going to the valve obviously impacts that quite a bit as well. Like how, how much the water is, is allowed to move back through from that water hammer and mm-hmm. what it actually uh, affects. But it's definitely from a mainline perspective, as that water moves, you cut off that water at the valve. That's the trigger point. That's the, the uh, epicenter, if you will, of, of everything. And it fires back through. It's not going back downstream um, into the lateral lines. It's staying within that main line. And that's why it's so kind of dangerous, especially when you work with those larger systems. Yeah, there is actually a manufacturer out there, an irrigation manufacturer that has designed a valve that um, when that water hammer situation occurs, the valve actually opens up for just a second or so and will disperse that energy downstream, as you said, you know, into the uh, where the sprinkler heads are and then that air can be exhausted. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times, on irrigation systems where they've used this uh, this particular valve. Um, sometimes when valves are switching, one zone is coming on and then coming on and one is going off, um, that another zone just way out there somewhere will just kind of pop up the rotors for just a second and come down. That's That particular valve is actually expelling that energy to the downstream side. And point number three here on the on the left hand side of you know what they're caused by is exactly what you're talking about, Jake, is that you have high velocities, large volume of water. Remember, a cubic foot of water, um, you know, weighs um, a little over 62 pounds, and the change of direction. That water is moving in one direction down, say, 100 feet of pipe, and it comes to a 90, and all of a sudden it has to go in one direction and another. Um, there's going to be pressure on that 90. There's going to be a surge on that 90. It, it's just the nature of the system. Long pipe runs. Well, yeah, because the longer the pipe run, the more volume, the more weight of water that you have you know, coming down to this 90 or this uh, valve closing. Trapped air is probably one of the biggest issues um, in causing water hammer. And, and again, valve switching on and off are just, uh, that's just the nature of our system. In, in uh, domestic supply systems where they're moving water you know, through a neighborhood, um, the main line, the city main line, they can move water much faster just simply because they don't have the switching of valves going on and off. And, and water starting and stopping. So, any other any other thoughts or questions? No, I say we uh, get through the recap, um, and then we'll handle any other ones that might come up. Perfect. Well, again, you know, we have additional design resources for manufacturers. Uh, the IA, um, your irrigation manufacturers, your pipe manufacturers. That stuff is all free. I mean, my library is full of little pamphlets and and little booklets and PDF files and everything um, that I've been able to download uh, for free that in a lot of cases um, are in some of the uh, textbooks that I've had to pay for. So there's a lot of free online stuff. Uh, And you just want to make sure that... um, that you remember as you're putting your design together, you know, think about, yeah, I can get to five feet per second, you know, using a three inch main line, but you know what, I'm going to go with a four inch main line because it's really going to reduce my velocity. Every project that you design, every project needs every opportunity to succeed long-term. 
And so just by upsizing, the pipe is not going to be that much of a cost. The fittings are going to be more expensive. I don't argue that. But for the long-term success of that project, putting the cost in up front is, is really a good decision. And we've already talked about pressure surges and water hammer. And slowing the water down below five feet per second, you know, I, I've been harping on that all the way through this presentation. That is the uh, one thing that you have total control over is slowing the water down. You want to go down below three feet per second? That's fine. On these, uh, I would highly recommend it. I know irrigation consultants when they're doing 12 inch main lines on a on a um, golf course, they're moving water at two feet per second just because of these um, computerized um, central control systems on golf courses allow them to make a lot of changes. Um, and so it's not uncommon over a year for a golf course to have anywhere between 40,000 to 750,000 changes in their irrigation schedule over a year. That's a lot of on and off water moving back and forth. So slowing the velocities down is the one thing that you can really do to help manage pressure surges and water hammer. Um, and know the types of fittings that you should use. Um, again, get on these various websites and take a look. Should I be using Schedule 40 or should I be using Schedule 80 fittings if I'm going to use solvent well? Um, you know, and because their burst rates are different. Um, and then make sure that you're um, installing the thrust blocks correctly. Um, I know that many of you as designers uh, don't always have the ability to go out and do the inspection. Um, you know, that I understand that. Your client is trying to save money, but making sure that these thrust blocks are installed properly is key to mitigating uh, damage. And then, um, you know, use the resources when calculating um, uh, sizes of thrust blocks. If you're not comfortable doing that, and, and a lot of people are, and they don't wanna take on the responsibility, I totally get that, you know, contact, um, you know, some of these engineering companies. Um, E.J. Prescott is one, and, and there's, one in, um, there's one in Logan, Utah. Uh, I can't remember the name of it uh, right off the top of my head, but they're around, um, these hydraulic engineers. You know, reach out to them and ask them to help you do that. So I think that just about covers it. Yeah. Any uh, last questions, please, guys, write them in. Um, we did get one question if asking if the presentation is going to be made available as a PDF download. Um, I'm sure with your blessing. Oh, absolutely. Put that in uh, a PDF form for you guys to download on the recorded version of this that will be posted later today. Um, I will also mention, as we've talked about velocities and, and different things, um, those using land effects obviously know there's a lot of automated stuff that goes on with the mainline sizing, with the lateral sizing, and the system does put some stops in just from a, a general guideline of, all right, we're going to stop it at three feet per second. Um, and if it goes anything lower than that, it's, it's cross-checking you saying, hey, um, you're, you're going to be exceeding your, your available or based on, on this condition. Um, there's, you can totally, as you're sizing things, go ahead and drop it below three feet per second and have the system still size at a slower speed. But from an automated standpoint, we, we needed a stopping point and figured that's a pretty reasonable yeah. spot to stop um, yeah. so any slower go ahead and use those toggles like we give you and um, continue to to play with what it will allow you to do but you can see too you know on that one slide that we did um, earlier where we had 
started out with three inch main line and we were at five feet per second and then we just bumped it up to four feet you know and we're we're right around that three feet per second can i say yep. four feet four inch four inch um, yep yeah that's you know these are things that in land fx that you have control over when you're looking in at your water source and you're saying you know i'm not going to go to the five foot i'm going to take it down to which i do in land fx i always when i'm designing a sports field or something like that first thing i do i go to that water source and i take and i drop that down to three feet per second yep that's a great great uh workflow for that for sure um mm -hmm. set your defaults for what that is so um you know what i i don't think uh we're going to get any more questions it's okay. friday so we should call it a day you did a great job thank you everybody for attending and uh if you have questions i'm assuming uh don you're cool with us passing those along to you absolutely so you guys bet. just reach out to us and we're happy to pass those questions on but uh Thanks again. Have a good weekend. All righty. Thank you.